Welcome to this series about optimizing performance in Unity. This is the second video about planning and setting an optimization budget. You can find other videos from this series in the description below. A path to great performance and smooth user experience starts even before writing the first line of code. It begins with a planning and budgeting phase, when we can brainstorm our overall vision of a game and research potential platforms and devices on which we want our game to be available. We should consider the limitations like hardware, available time and funds, but also various workarounds and necessary compromises. To divide this process, let's look at it step by step. So we have to research and decide the type of a game or an application, target devices and hardware, target frame time, and render pipeline and path. Let's start with research to decide a type of game and target devices and hardware. There are two ways to approach the beginning of a creation process. We can start with an idea for a game or an application. We decide a genre, theme or visual complexity like 2D or 3D. And then consider different platforms on which we want our product to be available. Obviously, if we want to create a photorealistic 3D simulator, we will aim at a PC or high-end consoles as a target platform. However, if we go for a 2D arcade game, we have more freedom, as it can be published to a whole array of devices, including mobile ones. Still, there are times when the platform is a starting point and priority, defining possible choices for the complexity of a game like VR and XR devices. Everything depends on the variables that are a priority. We can focus on a creative vision or approach it more methodically, analyzing the gaming industry as a whole. That includes the popularity of different platforms, statistics of processing power, options of monetization and so on. This is a broad topic on its own, so I won't go into details here. But let's see examples of some statistics which we can use to decide target devices and hardware. Steam aggregates a lot of useful data, which you can use when targeting PC, Mac and VR devices. You can find them here. From the numbers below, we can briefly determine what devices and market share are available for any given specs. It's up to you to dig as deep as you want into this analysis, to find a balance between the complexity of the game and the size of the market you will be able to target. After we decide the range of hardware specs we aim for, Depending on a budget, it's beneficial to invest in actual devices, covering the low and high end of the spectrum. It's possible to test the game on the slowest targeted hardware and expect it to work at least just as good or even better on faster devices. However, it is usually not that straightforward, especially for mobile platforms. Also, we can consider the adaptive performance to broaden a range of targeted devices. We will get to it later. FPS or frames per second is a popular metric used to measure a game's performance. However, it's quite misleading because as you can see it is non-linear. It's better and more straightforward to use an average frame time, where the duration of each calculation or a process is expressed in milliseconds. Now let's look at what exactly happens during one frame when our application is running. It's mostly a process of calculations and communication between the processor and the graphics card. And other components too, but let's keep it simplified for the sake of this example. The processor is responsible for computing our code, physics and other game engine components. Then it prepares the scene elements for rendering. These calculations are later passed to the graphics card for further processing and creating the final image. Their processing begins to overlap a bit after the CPU finishes certain calculations. However, a lot of processing is done sequentially, first by the processor, then by the graphics card. So the overall time of one frame is the aggregated processing time of both these units. Because it happens sequentially, one after another, it can cause an uneven bottleneck. If the processor requires much more time than the graphics card to make calculations and the graphics card therefore waits for the processor, then the game is CPU bound. When it is the opposite and the graphics card needs more time than the processor, the game is GPU bound. When optimizing performance, we tend to focus on the slowest processes, 
And as we introduce changes and improvements, the challenge of optimization often fluctuates between the processor and the graphics card. Displays and monitors show the picture with a particular constant frequency, based on the hardware, which in turn is based mainly on the frequency of electricity. The numbers are either 60 or 120 Hz, but there are already devices that run at 240 Hz. Most popular VR devices run at 90, 120 or 144 Hz. After both processor and graphics card have finished calculations, the final frame is sent to the display. It happens as quickly as possible, but the time between these updates is not constant and fluctuates, depending on the changes in the actual gameplay content. This situation will usually result in screen tearing, a visual artifact caused by a lack of synchronization between runtime processing speed and the display refresh rate, where a display device shows information from multiple frames in a single screen draw. It is most visible during horizontal movements of the camera. Vertical synchronization, or VSync for short, solves this problem. It locks the frame rate at specific values, the same as the different refresh rates mentioned before. Therefore, with VSync synchronized with a 60Hz refresh rate, when both processor and graphics card calculations take together less than around 16.6 milliseconds to run, the remaining time is not used for processing, and each new image frame is displayed at constant intervals, precisely 60 times per second. However, when either processor or graphics card is slower, and together they need even a little more than 16.6 milliseconds to run, Vsync will force the simulation to wait till the next frame, effectively decreasing the frame rate to an even 30 FPS. If our game isn't properly optimized and this frame rate often changes between 30 and 60 frames per second, the player will most likely notice something is a bit wrong. And this becomes a real problem on a VR device, as these FPS jumps cause discomfort. That's why optimizing VR apps is so important. There are a few essential things to remember when developing for mobile platforms. Vising is forced to be always turned on at a hardware level, Despite the settings in Unity, mobile platforms don't render half frames. It is best not to use the higher frame rate all the time, because if the device temperature raises too much, the thermal throttling will be turned on and the overall maximum clock speeds are going to be reduced. It is recommended by Unity to plan for this overhead and to use about 65% of the available frame time. We should also remember the profiler may report slow performance if the device is hot even if it is not a consistent long-term problem. So it's best to keep the device cool by profiling in short cycles. Another reason for aiming at a lower frame rate is to extend battery life. It's best then to run the game at 30 FPS, which is Unity's default number for mobile devices. To address these limitations, frame rate can be changed dynamically during runtime to differentiate between less and more dynamic scenes. We can also consider giving player a choice to select the maximum frame rate in the settings. Lighting, effects, render pipelines and paths are complex topics going beyond the scope of this series. So I recommend that you study the available Unity documentation and other sources that are linked below. Before we start working on our project, we need to choose and commit to one of the available render pipelines. There are three pre-built render pipelines in Unity. Built-in, universal and high definition. It's also possible to create a custom one as scriptable render pipeline. We also have to choose a rendering path, either forward rendering or deferred shading. Choosing a rendering pipeline or a path is not an optimization itself. However, it affects how we optimize the project. Other optimization techniques often vary depending on these choices. Plan optimization now and don't postpone it. Unity team has a recommendation to make optimization a design consideration and not a final step. Avoid careless waste of resources. Set a safe performance margin. Consider a variety of bottlenecks. Consider the features of the target platform and devices. Remember that the later the measures are applied, the more difficult they are to apply. A game will not cause surprising performance issues on release if any occurring issues are addressed throughout development. 
That's all for now. I hope you have enjoyed this video and learned something valuable. In the next video, I will talk about optimization cycle and process. And you can find other videos from this series in the description below. Take care and see you soon.